Today I want to talk about Thunder methods, when to override them and when to basically avoid them. We've all seen and used Thunder methods before. The most common one is the Thunder init method to initialize an object. And they offer a lot of flexibility. They allow you to basically change everything that Python does under the hood. But if you're not careful and you use them in the wrong way, it leads to really confusing code and makes your programs really hard to understand. In short, with great power comes great responsibility, which by the way, I learned is a quote from a Spider-Man comic. So now I'm in Marvel mode. Holy list comprehension Batman. Before I talk about Donner methods, let's take a step back and explore the history behind the Python data model. Python as a language was created with a strong emphasis on simplicity and readability. Guido van Rossum, the creator of Python, he wanted a language that would be easy to understand and express ideas in a really concise manner. And to achieve this, Python embraces the concept that basically everything is an object. That means that every piece of data in Python, doesn't matter if that's a number, a string, a list, or even a function, is represented internally as an object. And this choice led to the development of the Python data model. So what exactly is the Python data model? Well, at the core, it's the model that defines the rules and protocols that define how objects behave in Python. It provides, let's say, a standard interface and a set of protocols that objects follow. And that way they can work seamlessly with built-in Python features like determining what the length is of something. Central to the Python data model are the Dunder or double underscore methods. These are special methods denoted by double underscores before and after the names that allow us to define how objects interact with various operations and built-in functions in Python. So this gives us the power to completely customize the behavior of our objects. And that is what makes Python such a flexible language. Donder methods are like hooks into the Python interpreter. And by overriding them, we can define operations such as object creation, how objects are being represented, accessing attributes, iteration, and lots and lots more. Typically, these Donder methods are not going to be invoked by yourself, but by the Python interpreter, so that it looks like they're being called by magic. And that's also why Donder methods are called magic methods. So that's another name you might encounter from time to time. Now, the data model is, of course, not static. I mean, every new version of Python, there's going to be new Donder methods that extend the capabilities of the language and that means that every time there's a new version you can override more Donner methods and customize more behavior. Like I said before overriding Donner methods can be really powerful and useful but you have to be careful. So here are some guidelines for when to override Donner methods and when to avoid doing that. A first case where it's useful to override Donner methods is if you want to implement custom behavior. So I have an example here it's a class point has an X and Y value. And you see I've implemented the wrapper Donder method. So this is going to give us a developer focused, developer oriented string representation of the point class. So when I run this, then you see that it outputs the string representation of the point. So this is where it makes a lot of sense to add a Donder method so that we can easily, when we call print, on the object, then uh, we have control over what is actually being printed. So we implement custom behavior. Other examples of where you might want to do this is overriding get item so that you have square bracket access to a list of things, uh, things like that. Another reason why you might want to override Donner methods is if you want to simulate some sort of type or if you want to patch into another system that relies on something being of a specific Type. And this is especially useful for built-in types like lists and dictionaries and so on. For example, I have a class account here, which is a bank account. And then I have another class called bank, which maintains a dictionary of accounts. And what I've done is that I've overridden a couple of Donder methods like length to get the number of accounts, get item that gets a specific account from an account number, and also having iterator access. Because of that, I can now iterate directly over the bank object and get access to the accounts. So if you take a look at the main function here, I create a bank, I create a couple of accounts, do some deposits, doesn't really matter. But then you see here, I'm accessing a specific account using the square bracket. And that's possible because of the get item donder method that I implemented. Similarly, I can very easily retrieve the number of accounts in the bank by simply calling the len function on the bank object. And also because I have implemented the iter donder method, I can now write a for loop for account 
in bank and then it's going to print the account balance and account number and this is all possible because of these dunder methods that bring bank closer to operating like a dictionary and because bank implements these dunder methods i can also pass it to other functions that for example require something to be an iterable or things like that and you see when i run this code then we're actually going to get the results that we expect so number of counts and we have the balances and the account numbers so that's the second reason emulating built-in types. The third reason why you might want to override Dunder methods is if you need operator overloading. So in this case, we have a vector class that has an X and a Y value. And I've implemented a couple of Dunder methods here, like add for adding two vectors or for checking whether one vector is the same as another vector. And of course, you can add more, like um, maybe you want to have also the subtract version of that, which is simply going to return the vector and the subtract the X and the Y values. You may want to add multiplication. Um, you, might, you may want to add it for different types. So there's lots of features you might want to add to the vector class simply by overriding the operators. Because now what you can do is we can create some of these vectors and we can call, for example, A plus B. And that's going to use this under method to compute a new vector. And as you can see, that it works as expected. So that's vector. So vector one, two plus vector three, four is vector four, six. And also comparison works because I implemented this under method. So if you compare A to B, which are different vectors, then the output is going to be false. A and D are different vector objects, but the values are the same. So this is going to output true. And that's also what you see when we run the script. Now, if I didn't have this equal Donder method, and then I would run the script again, you see that now actually the second comparison returns false because actually A and D are different objects. So when you compare them, the result is going to be false. And that's what the equal Donner method helps us solve. Because of course, in vector math, we want these things to be actually the same vector. So building these kind of objects where you need to define the behavior for these types of operations, Donner methods are really useful and it makes total sense to override them. Another example of where it's very useful to override Donner methods is if you need a context manager. So here I have an example, this is not actual running code, it's just to show how it works. But we have a data connection class that gets a host, a username and a password, and there's an enter and an exit Donner method. And these two methods are needed if you want to create a context manager. By the way, there's also a decorator version of this that uses a generator. But I'm using this to show you why it makes sense to use Donner methods in a class. And then when you define these methods, well, then you can use the with statement. Then you can create this database connection object, pass the information that you need, do some query. And then after that, the connection is automatically closed at the end of this with block because then exit is called and then self.connection.close is called. By the way, this is a very basic example. You can do many more things with context managers. For example, exit can return a Boolean to indicate whether an exception should be suppressed or not, for example. But I kept this really basic. So four cases, implementing custom behavior, emulating existing types, operator overloading and building context managers. So quick question, have you seen these uses in your own code base? Are there other reasons you can think of when it makes sense to override Donner methods? Let me know in the comments. So clearly there are cases where it makes a lot of sense to override Donner methods, but there are also situations where you might be tempted to override Donner methods, but you actually shouldn't. So I'm going to cover four of those cases in the second part of this video. So the first one is that if you override Donner method, you have to be careful that you might actually increase complexity without even realizing it. So here's an example of that. I have a validator class and the goal of this little program is that I wanted to create something where I can have multiple validation functions and then run that on uh, some values. So I have here a function that checks that a value is even, uh, that it's positive. You can add more to these, obviously. Then I have a class called validator which has a list of validator functions. So these are uh, callables that get an int and return a bool. So examples are is even and is positive. And then I have a method add validator where I can add a validator function that just adds it to the list. And then I've overridden the call Donner method, which then runs all of these validator functions on a particular value. And what this does is that it allows function like behavior on an object. This is actually 
syntactical sugar for a function, sort of. So in the main function, what I can then do is create a validator object by passing it the validators. And then I can call this object as a function because it has the call dunder method. So I can perform the validation by doing this. And then it's going to print a result. So for, yes, it's true because it's both even and positive and seven is going to return false. And when I validate seven, that's of course going to output false because it's not even. So let's run this and you can see this actually works. The problem is that here we're actually slightly overcomplicating things. Why do we need a separate class that contains a list of validators and then we need to overwrite the call method? It's a bit complex. A simpler way to do it is to actually not use a class at all, but simply use a function for this. Here we have another version of the same code, but now it has a validate pipeline function that gets an iterable of validator functions, returns another validator function, and then this is the body of that function. So what I'm doing here is I simply create a new function that takes a value and then calls all of the validators on that value and then I return that function. So this is what we call a higher order function. That's a function that gets functions as arguments or has a function as a return value and this actually has both. Although validators itself is not a function, it's an iterable. Then we define validate functions as usual. And in the main function, it's actually really simple. We don't create any objects. We simply call validate pipeline that creates a pipeline validator function for us. And then I can call that function. To me, this is simpler than using a class with a dollar method. But if you're not comfortable with higher order functions, I can also totally understand you would maybe opt for the class based approach, or you might not even have this return function, but simply get a value and a list of validators. That's also possible. There's lots of ways in which you can solve this. But my point is that overriding a dollar method is not always the right or best solution. And what's actually really important is to always keep this argument of simplicity in mind. Also when you're doing code reviews, always ask yourself the question, hey, can this code be simpler? Can we remove things? Can we make things easier to use? And if you want to become better at doing code reviews, you should check out my workshop on code diagnosis. That you can get access to for free by going to iron.co slash diagnosis. It's about half an hour takes you through lots of practical examples showing you how to actually look at code and diagnose problems fast. So iron.co slash diagnosis, this is the link. I've also added to the description of the video. The second case where you want to avoid overriding Donner methods is if it violates the principle of least astonishment. I like that, it's a great name. And this basically means that you should write your code in such a way that the behavior is as expected. And the thing with Donder methods is that it's very easy to do something that is really surprising that you wouldn't expect if you use the object in a particular way because you change the way that the Donder methods are doing their job. For example, here I have a class payment where I have overridden the new Donder method. So new is basically what gets called when an object is created. And what I did here is that I accepted a payment type, which is a string. And then if it's PayPal, I'm creating a PayPal payment object. And if it's a card, I'm creating a Stripe payment object. And then I have pay method. And then these things are subclasses which, with their own pay method implementations. And then in the main function, I create a payment object and then I pay a certain amount. So when I run this, Actually, you see that it costs paying $1 using Stripe, but that's because the payment initializer now actually doesn't create a payment object. It creates either a Stripe payment object or a PayPal payment object, which is very surprising because if you look at this code, you would expect this thing to be a payment object, which, well, it is due to inheritance, but you wouldn't expect this to create anything else than a payment object. And that's potentially very confusing. You may think it might be nice because now we can pass a string and that's going to determine what kind of object we're going to get, which can be useful, you know, if you uh, read the payment type from a file or if you get that from um, an API call or something like that. But by doing this non-standard thing, you're potentially creating all sorts of problems because, for example, a developer might look at this and think, oh, hey, the payment class doesn't have a pay method implemented. So I should probably create my own subclass now to actually implement that payment method. But no, that's not necessary because we already have those, but that's not clear from the code itself. Basically, it just makes your code harder to read or to reason about, so avoid those type of things. So how do you then implement this in the correct way? Well, 
Here I have an example where I slightly changed this. So I added a payment method class using uh, Python 3.11 string enums, by the way. I still have my PayPal payment and Stripe payment classes. And then I have a function create payment that we provide with a method. So that's one of these two. So that's exactly the same behavior as we had in the before version. And then depending on what the method is, I'm creating a different type of object. And then I'm using a simple payment protocol class that simply states, hey, you're getting an object that has a method called pay. That's it. And then we can use it in almost the same way. So create a my payment object with, by calling create payment. But now it's clear we're getting something of type payment and then I call the pay method on it. And this of course gives me exactly the same result, except that now I'm paying $100 using PayPal. A third reason why you might wanna avoid overriding Dunder methods is because it can have performance implications. Not so much the Dunder method themselves because they're at the core of what Python is, but by implementing them in the wrong way, it might lead to performance issues because these Dunder methods are being called internally by Python in many different places. For example, I have a point class here, the same one I showed you at the start, which has a comparison method. And I also have this uh, wrapper method. And let's say I wanted to be smart and think like, hey, you know what, if we have three dimensional points, I don't wanna have to change the comparison operation. I simply uh, use the string representation of the point and the other thing, and then I just compare those things. And if we wanna make it a bit more precise, we should probably even use uh, not string, but wrapper because that's actually what we want to call, right? And this may sound smart because now I can do this and add a Z value like so. And then the only thing I need to change is here self.z. And now I don't have to change the comparison operator. Sounds like a great idea. But by using the string representation, this is going to have serious performance consequences. I have an example here, main function where I create a bunch of points. So let me also add the Z value here. And then I create a target point. So also add that. And then I measure the performance of this particular operation, which checks if target point is in the points list. And this operation in uses the equals Dunder method to perform the comparison to verify that an object is actually in the points list. And then I'm running that like uh, 10,000 times. So when I run this code, you see that it takes two and a half seconds, which is quite a long time. Well, it's also 10,000 points, you might say, but I have a simpler version here. And to make it fair, let's also add the Z value here. There we go. But here I'm implementing a more traditional way of point comparison, which is simply comparing X, Y, and Z. And when I run this 10,000 times, then this is what happens. So instead of taking up 2.5 seconds, it now only takes 0.2 seconds. So that's a factor 10 performance, even more performance improvement. So the bottom line is be careful. When you override Dunder methods, make sure you're not accidentally affecting performance. And a fourth reason, which is a more general reason for avoiding overriding Dunder methods is that they may hamper readability of your code. Not all developers are comfortable with seeing Dunder methods and they might not fully understand what a Dunder method is doing or when it's being used. And that simply makes your code a bit more complex and harder to understand. And in the end, having code that's easy to read, easy to understand is actually a very big asset. So that's something you should always have in the back of your mind. The bottom line is be mindful of the extra complexity you introduce by overriding Dunder methods. And always ask yourself the question whether that's really necessary or if there's a simpler way to achieve the same thing. So good examples of when to override Dunder methods are when you need to implement custom behavior like a string Dunder method, when you want to emulate a built-in type like a dict or a list, when you need operator overloading, for example, if you want to build a mathematical library, uh, or when you need to have context management and you need to implement the enter or exit methods. Cases where you don't want to override Dunder methods are if they introduce unnecessary complexity, um, if they're violating the principle of least astonishment and it leads to your code not doing the thing that you expect it to do, if you don't have a clear understanding of what the effect is going to be on 
performance by overriding the Donner methods. And finally, avoid overriding Donner methods if you want to make sure that your code is easy to read and easy to maintain by a wide group of developers with different levels of skills. I hope this video gave you some food for thought on how to deal with the flexibility that Python offers us. Another area where Python is really flexible is that it allows us to choose between functions or classes. Now, I typically tend to go for functions initially and only use classes if that's necessary, but there are some other considerations as well in order to take that decision of when do you use a function, when do you use a class. If you want to learn more about that, watch this video next. Thanks for watching and take care.